let's get started here. Uh, welcome. My name is Jeff Kreipel. I'm a professor at Rice uh, University, and my guest today is Dr. Gustavo Rodriguez Rocha, um, whom we'll introduce or he'll self introduce here in a moment. Um, before we get going, um, the way the hour is going to work is Gustavo and, and I will have a conversation. Um, it'll last 30, 35 minutes, somewhere at 40, maybe somewhere in there. And then in the last 20 minutes or so, um, Gustavo will take questions. I'm going to ask you to enter your question in the Q&A function at the bottom of your, your webinar or Zoom screen. Uh, I'll read those and, and moderate those as well and then pass them on to Gustavo as, as, um, as we have time. Okay, all right. Thank you all. Uh, welcome, Gustavo. Welcome to um, the Archives of the Impossible, too. It's good to see you again. It's good to see you, Jeff. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you for the invitation. Great. I see you're at the Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California. Um, yes, exactly. So I chose this background today for our conversation. First of all, because I love Esalen, who doesn't? And, uh, but secondly, because the researcher will be referring to in our conversation uh, today took place at Esalen's ground. Okay, great. Well, maybe we can start there. Um, you know, we were chatting before the webinar started about our history together and what year that was we first met and um, through through David Kaiser, actually, it turns out up at MIT. And I do I do remember that now. But maybe you could just tell a bit of that story to to the to our to our colleagues here, and then we can we can dig in as it were. Okay, yes. So my PhD dissertation was on the history of dissident interpretations of quantum mechanics. Okay. And so I had the fortune to get this Fulbright scholarship. And so I spent a year or so at MIT under the supervision of David Kaiser, who wrote the book, How the, Phys How the Hips Saved Physics. And then by the end of my stay at MIT, I flew from Boston to San Francisco to spend about uh, a couple of weeks interviewing people that uh, were involved in this history that I was writing about. And so in the end, I interviewed Michael Murphy, the co-founder of the Islam Institute. And uh, the day after that, I drove all my way up to the Big Sioux, and then I spent a couple of days uh, re researching the archives of the Esalen Institute, and that was back in 2013. Okay. So let's let's start there. I mean, let's. I mean, I'm not I'm not a physicist, Gustavo, as you know well. Uh, I'm not a historian of physics either. But what does what what do these alternative or dissident interpretations of quantum mechanics have to do with, with Esalen? Let's start there. Well, it has to do with the Esalen because back in the 70s, Esalen provided the space for people who wanted to debate the foundations of quantum mechanics. Uh, at the time that it was almost forbidden to talk about the foundations of quantum mechanics. So they even had that motto, shut up and calculate. Do not think about what quantum mechanics means, right? And so the Esalen provided the space for those physicists who were interested, including Clauser, who won the Nobel Prize this year, uh, to debate and discuss uh, uh, the problems of the interpretations of quantum mechanics. And uh, so I will take from there to understand how I, by doing this research uh, about the dissident interpretations of quantum mechanics, that encouraged me to investigate us for my postdoctoral research, which was at 
UC Berkeley uh, between 2016 and 2018 to investigate marginalized scientific inquiries as a research topic by itself. Because I was studying rejected interpretations of quantum mechanics. I decided to study rejected knowledge as a broader category. So we, so this is to back up a bit. What, what year did David Kaiser's book come out, How the Hippies Save Physics? Well, I think it was uh, in 2011. Okay, so it was, it was a little before you were there. I mean, I, mem I remember it, I read it, I, I've taught it. Um, you know, the phrase shut up and calculate is, is, is he makes a, a great deal of that phrase. Um, particularly during the Cold War, where the physicists were really hired to build the bomb, really, uh, and were discouraged heavily from um, the philosophical implications of quantum mechanics, yeah, which, of the, which the earlier quantum physicists, the people who founded or, or really, really pioneered the, the physics were all not all, but most of them were fascinated by the philosophical implications. So may, yeah, maybe- Yeah, we're talking about that all the time. Yeah, I mean, they were obsessed. They were obsessed with the philosophical implications. So maybe we can start there because I do think, I mean, eventually we want to get to the impossible or you know, strange things happening. And of course, today, a lot of people do invoke quantum mechanics, um, sometimes as, as physicists, but oftentimes not as physicists. And I'd, I'd like to kind of pick your brain a bit or, or dig down into what are, what are some quantum mechanical interpretations you find plausible and what are some quantum mechanical interpretations you find um, too dissident or, or too undisciplined, you know? I guess, I guess that might be a way of putting it. Um, right, so I don't have uh, uh, really I stand in, in, in this issue, but uh, uh, I would say that I tend to be uh, more uh, attached to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum yeah. mechanics, which was uh, better uh, developed by Niels Bohr. Okay. And so can you explain that to our, to our audience? I mean, uh, the Copenhagen interpretation, I know, is controversial, but it's also very, it's very much respected in the quantum mechanical community. Yes, and the problem is when you say the Copenhagen interpretation, you don't have an agreement uh, between those who claim to be uh, defending the Copenhagen interpretation. So you have actually several in Copenhagen interpretations. Okay. So well, which, my, one, which, which one are you opting for? Let's start there. So my own interpretation of uh, uh, quantum mechanics, uh, well, first of all, I should say that philosophically, I'm a, a, a kind of anti-realist, meaning that I don't think theories and models in science mirror nature as nature is really Okay. So I understand that language that including our concepts, mathematics, mathematical tools and everything else uh, works as tools, as instruments. So we have tools, but uh, we have methods, but we should not confuse our methods to approach uh, the natural world with reality itself. I think the Copenhagen interpretation that I uh, hold is this more pragmatic interpretation of not only quantum mechanics, but uh, an interpretation of what scientific theories and models actually tell us about the world. So, and so go ahead, go ahead, Gustav. So if you are not attached to the semantic of the description of uh, scientific theories, 
you can uh, solve uh, some of the puzzles that we come across when studying uh, quantum physics. Uh, the duality puzzle, for instance, you know, if uh, I, I, I'm sitting uh, on a chair right now, but outside this building, it's raining. If I get this chair and use it as an umbrella, it's not a chair anymore, it's an umbrella, right? If someone wants to attack me in the streets and I try to defend myself with the chair, now it, it's, it's my, my, my field or something, like I'm defending myself with the chair. So the, the actual meaning of the words depends on how we use the objects. It's not only a quest of putting a, a tag with the sign uh, upon the object, and then we have defined the object just by putting uh, uh, a, a sign on it. We actually uh, create meaning uh, through uh, semantics, through syntax, and through pragmatics. But uh, scientists forgot the pragmatical level of our understanding. And Niels Bohr was always trying to re remind us that language is just a tool. And that the meaning depends on the setting of the laboratory where you are carrying out your experiment. So if some things, if an electron is a wave or is a, a, a corpuscule, uh, that will depend on uh, uh, what experiments I'm carrying out in my lab. Just as the chair will receive the proper name depending on how I'm using this object to sit on it, to, to shout from the rain, or to protect myself from someone who is attacking me. Yeah. So I know I know at Esalen in the seventies the, that these hippie physicists who are interested in things like entanglement um, were very much interested in them because they thought they were connected to parapsychology and to to people's experiences of being connected in ways that didn't seem possible, right? And I also know that a lot of these hippie physicists believed that consciousness or subjectivity was somehow involved in physical reality, that it, it shaped what reality was or would determine a, ter determine a scientific experiment, but could also perhaps determine <clears throat> reality itself. I mean, and this of course gets into the impossible. This gets into the, the theme of the conference, which is what do we do as intellectuals, as historians of science in this case, when we are confronted with ex human experiences that are not supposed to happen, um, but that happen. And, and so things like, you know, knowing instantly when a loved one is dying or um, knowing about something that hasn't happened yet. Um, do, do these rejected forms of knowledge help us there or do they, do they hinder us there? If, I mean, if science is really just is pragmatic, as you're arguing, it, 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 it essentially tells us what we need to know to do a particular task. It doesn't tell us about reality as it is. Um, yes, but that's when things become interesting. Okay, so go on. Uh, so the, my, 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 my research that followed this uh, uh, PhD research was actually what took me to all these subjects that we are uh, discussing in the archives of the Impossible Conference. Uh, you know, the, uh, the philosopher Karl Popper saw the demarcation problem as the central problem in the philosophy of science, although his approach to the question is out of fashion now. So in epistemology, the demarcation problem is the question to distinguish science and no science. It examines the boundaries between science, sealed and science, and other products of human culture. 
So as a historian of science, I take an empirical, not an abstract look at this question, not a question in abstract as it was for Popper. So I realized that we could learn more about history of science and about the demarcation problem if you took a closer look at knowledge that has been rejected, but it is nevertheless in interaction with the dominant uh, mainstream epistemology. And I call it rejected epistemis. Uh -huh. I think the study of rejected epistemis, which began with my postdoctoral research at UC Berkeley, uh, when I had as a case study of uh, knowledge being built in the boundaries, the Sussan group, the survival seminar group, yeah. right? And, and so that was a way to study empirically the demarcation problem as historians, sociologists of science and so on and so forth do today very differently from the take that Pope had back uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. So I chose to study this research initiative, uh, which is really at the boundaries of academia, uh, because uh, it proposes, as you know, uh, against the dominant point of view of the neuroscience and the cognitive science today, uh, it proposed that consciousness cannot be reducible to any sort of materialistic framework of explanation or ontology or metaphysics, the so-called materialistic monism. So, uh, so I chose this topic for my research and uh, um, I, I, I was at UC Berkeley because I was founded by the Jürgen Ramstein Center for Science and Religion of the University, University of Oxford uh, uh, that has this three-year project that had three main questions. One of them was the relationship between minds, the minds, the brain, and the person, right? So that's why I decided to have the survival seminar, uh, which, as I said, took place at the grounds of Esalen for 15 years and published three major works uh, as my case study to investigate the boundaries. Of course, I have to add something here, Jeff, because this is how I rationalize uh, my own trajectory, because actually I had to find uh, my way uh, through the academic world to uh, actually research my deepest interests that I have since I was a child or a teenager. So yeah. that's the way I found uh, to uh, make uh, this kind of research. As you mentioned, uh, you mentioned in, in your uh, last book, The Superhumanists, I could not play the Superman, so I had to play Clark Kent, right? right? So that's right. how I framed my research. But behind that uh, uh, framing, you find uh, my deepest interests uh, since uh, I was. Uh, uh, a little kid. Yeah, so, we, all, we all have to be Clark Kent in some ways. We have, you know, we have to get the job, as they say. You, you, Superman's there, but we Superman never gets a job. Um, so I mean, let's go back. So Sir Sam, of course, stands for Survival Seminar, and we're talking about a fifteen-year conference or symposium series at Esalen. They produce these three volumes that you refer to. Um, it's really about the survival of bodily death. That's what those, those events were about. And what they concluded was that before they can really answer whether consciousness survives death, they needed to answer the question of what's the relationship of mind or consciousness to brain. Um, because if it's if consciousness is brain, full stop, 
of course, there's no survival of bodily death. The brain dissolves, and so does the, the mind or the con or consciousness. But if there is, but if there is not a necessary connection between mind and consciousness and the brain, then of course it can survive bodily death. At least if it's possible. Um, so I'm just trying to get a hold of. I mean. To me, that's really the whole thing. I mean, that's that's what makes impossible phenomena possible is a different model of the mind mind body interaction. Exactly, and there are uh, four features that uh, I would like to mention that uh, took my attention uh, when I was researching the Sussan group. Uh, the first feature is that they challenge the ontological reductionism that prevails in the modern system of knowledge, which is physicalism, and it uh, twin counterpart in the humanities uh, contextualism. So they challenge that very mainstream academic scientific framework. That was one thing that took my attention. Another thing that took my attention is the content of the first book, Irreducible Mind, which is about all these anomalies, things like near-death experiences, uh, paranormal phenomena, such as clairvoyance, precognition, telepathy, telecinesis, uh, secondary centers of consciousness, including multiple personalities, mediumship, cases of uh, reincarnation type studied by Young Stevens uh, initially, uh, uh, you know, uh, deathbed visions, then now lucidity, and so on and so on. So I was very interested in the concepts as put forward by Thomas Kuhn that these are anomalies to the current framework uh, of our conventional scientific worldview. So uh, an anomaly for Thomas Kuhn is something that is not expected to be true once you are inside this framework that is basically guiding everyone's research in the field, right? So it requires another framework. And that framework should be something different from physicalism and contextualism. And so that's uh, something that interested me deeply. Uh, another thing that I noted uh, about all this phenomenology that are uh, anomalous uh, phenomena of human consciousness is that uh, these anomalies if you take a close look at them as a whole, it's always referring to uh, some sometime near death or near birth, you know? It can be literally like, uh, uh, you know, little kids who remember lives that are not uh, the lives they are living, so it's, around birth in a sense, because they are still very little, yeah. or around death, like near death experiences or, or uh, apparition crisis and things like that, uh, death bad visions and so on and so forth. But it can be close to death and birth also metaphorically. If you have, if you get the phenomenon of mysticism, for instance, the metaphor most used to describe the phenomenon. So we have basically three main metaphors. Awakening, as if you were asleep before the event. Uh, enlightenment and rebirth or the, the death of this ego that I call I or me, and the birth of uh, uh, a true, truer self. 
So although a, this kind of mystic experience can happen at any time of someone's life, the metaphors still refer to birth and death. So that was another thing that took my attention about this phenomenon. And the fourth uh, aspect of the Sosain's uh, group research that took my attention, uh, that makes a lot of sense in the context of everything I have mentioned so far, it is that uh, some uh, of the members of the Sosain group proposed the so-called filter thesis, which makes more sense in the context of uh, ancient philosophy, pre-modern pre modes of knowing, like Platonism or, and, and other Western or non-Western traditions. So as we know, uh, the ancient Greek philosophers had the understanding that philosophy is a preparation for death. And the methods created by Socrates, for instance, was called myotics, which is the Socratic method. That means uh, uh, the art of giving birth, right? Uh, his mother was a midwife, and he thought he was a sort of midwife, but he gave birth to ideas, concepts, not uh, bodies, right? And, and so again, you see death and birth linked to the, the, the very description what philosophy was for the ancient Greeks. And uh, philosophy was uh, a spiritual exercise as Pierre Hadou's books show us very clearly. It's a misunderstanding to look at the Greek philosophy and interpret them as we interpret ourselves uh, and modern philosophy. So philosophy was a way of life. And this was what they called ascesis, spiritual exercise. So the organo, which is the word for method, you can find the collection of the works of logic in Aristotle is called uh, organo. And Francis Bacon in, in early modernity called uh, his book, The Novum Organum, The New Method. So the organum in, in the aspect of uh, uh, ancient philosophy is our constitution, our body, our mind, our soul, our spirits, whatever we are, this is the organum that must be changed through the assesses to get access to reality. So it's an experience which differs from modern science that is based on an experiment, not an experience, yeah. as a mode of knowing what reality is. So these are the four features that took my attention in the Sussing's uh, research. And then uh, I would have to go on, if you like, I could expand more on what I mean by rejected epistemis and how this concept can help us to uh, shed lights on these anomalous uh, phenomenon. Well, let's, let's put a bow on that or, or close, I mean, the, I'm, I'm hearing two, what I would call really big ideas that I think are worth kind of putting on the table. One is the, the distinction between the production thesis and the reduction thesis of the mind-brain relationship. In other words, if, if uh, the brain produces mind, then all of this impossible stuff is impossible. It's not gonna happen, it can't happen. 
it's it's meaningless it's it's silliness if on the other hand uh, the the reduction thesis is true and the brain reduces mind or translates it into a, a social ego or a, or a body then of course m many of these impossible phenomena become immediately possible so i think there's a there's a nice lineup between what you're calling the filter thesis which is a shift in the paradigm right a, a kunian yeah. shift yeah. in the paradigm that allows for this the impossible stuff to become possible and this this more conventional neuroscientific reductive model that the brain produces consciousness or produces mind in toto and therefore none of this stuff is actually possible so to me that's the the first big idea the second big idea is that idea that the human being is the ultimate detector of reality um you know experience is you're, you're privileging experience over experiment here um and which i i love um i happen to think that's the way to go but i in our culture we of course dismiss and demean experience and we privilege and and embrace experiment um so I think that that gets us into your notion of the rejected episteme or the reject rejected yeah. knowledge, which is a very Foucauldian way of talking, but it's a very, in some ways it's not Foucauldian at all, because I think you're pushing towards something that doesn't exist in our order of knowledge, right. but, that, but that does reflect actual human experience. Um, I, I, what I hear you saying is, our present order of knowledge actually dismisses human experience. Exactly. And, and if we take these experiences in and, and think with them, then we have to actually operate in a different order of knowledge, which, which we don't have at the moment. Right, exactly. So, so before talking about Foucault and his idea or concept of episteme and how I appropriated that idea for my own work on rejected epistemes. Let me uh, just go back a little bit uh, in what you, you have just said about the filter thesis. Uh, you have this uh, filter thesis, again, in classical Platonic philosophy, the filter is the body, the body as prison to the soul, right? But we have an advance uh, with the modern metaphor of the filter, which is that uh, it understands the filter as the result of a Darwinian evolution and natural selection. The view that natural, that uh, nature, the nature of knowing, the nature of uh, cognitive acquisition itself is transformed historically and the world that we construct out of our perception, concepts, and language is a humanized world. It's created for the sake of survival of the species. Yeah. So again, you see why I hold this unrealist position in the philosophy of science, because somehow it's more scientific, because it takes uh, Darwinian uh, natural selection into account when doing epistemology, you see? So now going back to the idea of episteme, uh, so Michel Foucault coined, coined that word, uh, I think in the archeology span of knowledge. So I, I love this passage, he says that an episteme is a worldview, a slice of history common to all branches of knowledge, which impose on each one the same norms and postulates. A general stage of reason, a certain structure of thought that the man of a particular period cannot escape. That's wonderful, that definition. And it's a concept also close to the concept of paradigm, in the work of Thomas Kuhn, yeah. and also the concept of unit's idea in Arthur Lovejoy, you know. So I, I brought all those ideas and the idea of uh, zeitgeist or a worldview 
that uh, generation has as the predominant worldview. And then we have the marginalized worldviews side by side, living through history with the dominant worldviews. And uh, taking uh, depth psychology as an example, it's as if the modern system of knowledge had a self, let's call it the scientific self. And this self has a shadow, a part of itself that was not well integrated and that this ego repels. It's like it, it's outer ego. Yeah. So we, we have this double in all the modern system of knowledge. So the, the kind of rejected knowledge that I'm looking for, by the way, Uko also, uh, he gave this lecture at the College de France uh, uh, when he used the expression subjug subjugated knowledge meaning a whole set of knowledge that had been disqualified as inadequate to their task or ins insufficiently elaborated. So he had something of this sort in mind, but uh, he worked primarily on, on the genealogy of the mainstream uh, episteme, right? So the idea of the rejected episteme is the idea that we have a shadow episteme that defines the mainstream episteme as the drawing hands by Asher, to you know that painting. So they dialectically define uh, one another. So it's impossible to have a full grasp of what modern science is having just half parts of the his history. So I'm trying to do this shadow history of modern science. That's what I'm trying to do. Now, uh, another thing about Foucault uh, is that I think it was his last interview uh, when he characterized himself as simply a Nietzschean. And to be honest, I like Friedrich Nietzsche more. And uh, in, in, in a famous essay titled On Truth and Lies in a Non-Moral Sense, uh, Nietzsche had two important insights uh, that were brought uh, fully to fruition only generations later, Foucault is an example. So the first of these insights is I, I never forgot this passage when he says, what then is truth? And he answers, it's a movable host of metaphors and metonymies and anthropomorphisms. So we, we tend to firmly believe in this sharp distinction between literal and figurative meaning. Again, we are talking about the, my unrealist position, the philosopher of science. And Nietzsche is reminding us that there is no such a thing as a literal meaning, as if our cognitive apparatus uh, could represent reality as a mirror. Uh, well, however, when when the metaphor becomes so uh, ubiquitous, so pervasive and petrified in our order of knowledge, in our modes of understanding, and then we start to take it literally as so, the representation of reality. Gustavo, let me, um, let me push this a little more. So uh, let me push your anti-realism. So are you saying that, well, obviously you are saying 
that scientific statements are not about reality. They're, they're pragmatic. They get us certain things and they get us certain truths that we can use and, and build things with, but that it doesn't refer or correspond directly to any kind of reality out there. Are you yes. saying that? I'm yeah. saying that uh, what we are calling the filter before yeah. is the structure as Kant himself uh, taught us. It's the structure of our experience. Right. Well, I not get that. The ground of being or being itself. The ground of being is filtered by this structure. And modern so science map it very yeah. well, this structure. So that was my question. So in your mind, there is a real there. There's a there there. There's a reality there. Yes. But but statements about it, truths about it are, are anti-realist. They're, they're Nietzschean in the sense that they're words strung together. They're, they're representations. They're not the actual thing. Exactly. And yeah. the things in itself, the nominal aspects used yeah. to name it, uh, can be accessed by no ordinary states of consciousness. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that's possible. important. Yeah, that's, that's the impossible right there. Yeah, that's the impossible. Exactly. Uh, so about the idea that uh, every knowledge in, in this common mode of knowing, of ordinary consciousness, every knowledge is uh, just uh, metaphors and uh, metonymies. Uh, this site was fully developed in two influential books by, you know, George Lakoff and Johnson, Metaphors We Live By and Philosophy in the Flesh. Yeah. So Gustavo, let me, I, I got to play the evil moderator here. We, we, have, we have 20 minutes and we're starting to get some questions um, in the Q&A. And I want to read you one of the questions that uh, I'd like to have you respond to if that's, a, if that's okay. And I, I want to encourage our, our listeners to keep putting questions in, in, um, in the Q&A. So here's, here's a question. And I'm going to read your names, folks. If you don't want me to read your name, please tell me, don't read my name. Um, but this is from John Martin. And he asks, if we allow for the idea that consciousness may exist apart from or in some form of entanglement with the body or the brain, what do you feel that the latter contributes to that entanglement apart from limitation or restriction? In other words, does consciousness need this physical form for some purpose or is it just something to transcend? Well, I think life would not make sense if the human experience was really some bad prison of our soul. Actually, I think this prison, so to speak, is exactly what makes life meaningful. Yeah. The limits and the finite. Again, the Greeks had that very clear in their minds. Well, if you but again, that, Gustavo, again, to push John's point here, if if it's the limits that gives us meaning and that gives us that can, constitutes life, why are people always having these experiences? Why why are why are these forms of transcendence happening at all if if the purpose of life or the goal of life or the meaning of life is in limitation? Well, because this ground of being is the source of human values. Okay. So we need to work hard to make this organ, this instrument capable of better filtering this okay content and we have to actualize that in this human experience so that's uh, the idea of vocation so organ can be an instrument like you have in a church an organ organ yeah. uh, means methods it yeah. means by which you achieve something right 
so we do, uh, we, we have as uh, our aim in life to actualize the, this potential that is uh, flowing through us, but cannot uh, completely realize itself unless we make an effort to that happen. Right. So, you know, if I can just translate, I think what you're saying, to speak in, 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 in the theological language of my, my ancestors, my family, the, the goal of life is to become a clear, a more clear mirror or filter or, or organon in your language or, uh, of, 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 of the ground of being. Or, yes. Or, okay. Yeah. So, okay. so the idea is that we have to somehow uh, unite the opposites, the finite and the infinite, the singular and the universal. Okay. So we have something that is universal, but we have something that is singular. Okay. And so this human actualization is the union of the opposites. When you become yourself, you know, that's the moral uh, obligation for Nietzsche. Right. Uh, der werden der du bist. You must become yourself. Yeah. That's the uh, Nietzschean uh, okay. saying. Okay, so another question. This one from uh, Michael Curian, actually. Michael asks, the idea of an unintegrated episteme that is essentially a repressed shadow of experiences we can't make sense of makes me think of Jung, Carl Jung. Does attempting to integrate and render conscious the shadow of his team, does this destroy the previous paradigm which forced the things it could make sense of underground? Or does it move the previous paradigm into a state of wholeness? So does that question make sense? In other words, is, is the shadow a shadow for a reason? Is it is it something that uh, that makes possible the present episteme, or is it something we need to acknowledge and integrate to towards some kind of greater episteme? Yeah, uh, that that's correct. That's how I see uh, uh, the latter. The latter. Well, yeah. So so as a psychoanalyst, uh, the the psychoanalyst wants to help uh, his or her uh, patients to integrate. Uh, his or her shadow, right? As a, a historian of science, I want to help our collective consciousness uh, to integrate the shadow of modernity. Okay. The shadow of modern science. That would be an emergent uh, new epistemology. So, 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 Gustavo, if you're me, if you're Jeff, and you're talking to your president and your dean and your provost at Rice University, why, why are you having this conference, Jeff? Come on, why are you doing this? Um, if I say, oh, it's to integrate the repressed shadow of, of modernity, um, that's an answer. In other words, the, the conference or the, the conference series or the, the intellectual project of taking these impossible experiences as possible is part of a long therapeutic healing process that will move Western culture into some more mature, um, more mature form of knowledge. Is that is exactly. that adequate? Am I am I yeah, translating correctly? Adequate. But uh, to understand what I mean by rejected epistemic, we need to understand what I mean by the modern system of knowledge. Yeah. Right. And uh, OK, so the idea of modernity is a modern invention. Right. And so you have the critics of this modern invention. You have some European centric critic of modernity, uh, such as uh, psychoanalysis, uh, Marxism, uh, feminism, uh, post-structuralism, post-modernity, and so on and so forth. 
And you have also a critic of modernity coming from non-European histories, such as uh, subaltern studies, uh, decolonial studies, uh, you know, and, and all that. So if you get uh, this idea that we have a critic of modernity and you follow these thinkers, you are going to find out that at some point, this critic became also a critic of our uh, mainstream epistemology. So if you get uh, the colonial studies, you find uh, authors like Boaventura de Souza Santos, who wrote this book, uh, Epistemologists of the South, you know. Uh, uh, it, so if you get the feminist epistemology, for instance, you, you have the attempt to form what uh, Sandra Harding, a feminist uh, uh, philosopher, calls a strong objectivity. So uh, some people accused the feminist epistemologists of being uh, relativist, yeah. but it's quite the contrary. She was arguing that she wanted a strong objectivity, a stronger objectivity. Uh, uh, you know, if I have an object on the table and there are several observers of that object, the more perspectives I get, the more objectivity I get about that object. So that's what the, the feminists were claiming when uh, criticizing the mainstream epistemology. There is a gender issue involved in the mainstream epistemology that they wanted to tackle. So the same thing works for all those critics or schools or streams of critics of modernity. You, you have an epistemological version of that, of those critics for every and each critic. So, so I Yeah, no, let me just let me, let me just shift the shift the talk here a little because again, I, I'm looking at the clock. We only have 10 minutes. And I want to ask another question that John Martin's posting, which I think is a question, a version I was trying to ask earlier. Let me frame this question first. You know, so Philip Ball is a science writer. He's a, he's a writer about the, the interpretation of science in modern culture. And essentially what Philip argues is that we need art and, and novelists and movie makers to interpret quantum mechanics for us and to help integrate these ideas into public culture. In other words, to move the ball forward, we have to reimagine what's possible and reimagine what quantum mechanics is. And, you know, John's question is, is whether either of us have seen this series called Dave's, uh, Alex Garland series called Dave's, D-E-V-S. I'm sure it's, it's Sanskrit for gods, um, which imagines some of the implications of quantum physics, particularly quantum computing for our understandings of time, death, memory, and reality. Uh, if so, if you've seen it, do you feel that its speculations are feasible or coherent, or did it miss something important in these discussions? So I have not seen this series, but I'm deeply interested in this question. What does quantum mechanics look like, you know, uh, as a film or as a television series or as a work of art? Is it something we can integrate into public culture, Gustavo? Or is it just something that there's no way we can ever integrate it? Okay, so let's go back to what I call the modern system of knowledge. Yeah. The modern system of knowledge is the ways we produce, classify, organize, and uh, popularize scientific knowledge in our uh, modern scientific academic 
establishments, laboratories, and so on and so forth. So that's uh, the system. It's like a living system that has a boundary, that has a metabolism, that has a history. And if we take again the depth psychology metaphor, and that's why I want to emphasize the importance of looking at the metaphors we are using. So I would say that I have identified three uh, major defense mechanisms uh, responsible for rejecting this rejected epistemis uh, or pushing them to the periphery, to the margins. And so, uh, so these are reductionism, which has many versions, ontological reductionism, methodological reductionism, epistemological reductionism. So reductionism is a sort of uh, defense mechanism uh, which uh, pushes this forbidden knowledge to the periphery of the modern system of knowledge, of this living system that cannot metabolize these anomalous experiences. So the second uh, me uh, defense mechanism is, is specialization. We have a fragmented uh, collective consciousness. And uh, as it happens in psychology, uh, for instance, uh, someone with multiple personality, it can ha happen that one personality is not aware of the other personality. So fragmentation in death psychology has always to do with forgetting who we really are. So specialization is a sort of splitting as a defense mechanism, you know, because we forget who we really are. We lose the big picture. So that's the difference between what I call a, a patchwork epistem, which is the modern epistem, and the architectural, architectural epistem, which is the pre-modern pre -modern kind of epistem. So it's as if I look to the Taj Mahal in India, you know, every piece of the building was put there, uh, having in sight the whole. So you have a symmetry uh, uh, on the reflection of the building on the uh, lake and, and the pool they have in front of it. You have a, an axial symmetry and so on and so forth. Now, a patchwork stem is what we have now, you know? We have a bunch of fields that we put together, but we have no idea whose hands were responsible for bringing that patchwork together. Yeah. So we have an unconscious metaphysics. And so that the metaphysics of, of postmodernity. It's yeah. an important metaphysics. We forgot yeah. that we need some sorts of metaphysics when we denied the need of metaphysics uh, in the birth of modern science. So uh, it, splitting is a mechanism of defense in psychoanalysis. It's uh, akin to specialization. And uh, another one is objectification. This Cartesian split between subject and object and the ideal of modern science of objectivity, meaning that we need to get more and more domains of human experience under the scrutiny of objectivity. We need to make uh, the field of our study an object. That's cool when you are building computers, but what about psychology, human sciences? social theories, 
can we object by objectivize uh, human consciousness? And, and that, that's the problem. But the tendency of the history of modern science is increasingly uh, uh, the tendency of uh, objectivation, right? So objectivation is, is, is also a, a, a defense mechanism. So uh, I, I could make analogies about, uh, you know, psychoanalysis defense mechanisms and those three uh, defense mechanisms that I have just mentioned. But uh, going, to the, 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 going back to the question, uh, so what happens is that uh, this ontological reductionism uh, has as a metaphor for the, the modern system of knowledge, I structure like a tree. So Descartes used the tree as a metaphor for the order of knowledge. Uh, 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 those uh, who uh, wrote uh, during the Enlightenment, the encyclopedia, D'Alembert and Diderot, they had a tree as the way they organize knowledge. What's the problem of this kind of uh, metaphor? The problem is that a tree is placed upon its roots. So you have a foundation. Yeah. So that's the kind of ontological reductionism that we have today. Yeah. So it's as if we construct from the simpler to the more complex systems from physics to chemistry, to physiology, to uh, psychology, to sociolo sociology, to uh, comparative study of religions and so on and so forth. Uh, and the, the more you go up in this building, the less real is what you are studying. Yeah, no, I, I'm well aware of that. I, I've been uh, one of those. More, the more yeah. you go down to the foundations of the building, yeah. The more uh, real you believe, uh, yeah. Your talk so, is. Gustavo, so, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I, we're out of time. I mean, I gotta, I gotta close this down. I mean, your last comments there. I just, just to close with a joke. I mean, Bron Taylor used to joke that, you know, in the Western worldview, the more dead something is, the more real it is, and the, the more alive it is, the less real it is, and. You know, I think that's basically what you were saying, that there's a built-in metaphysics in this order of knowledge that we're, we're challenging, I think. I hope, right. I hope. And if you get the ancient epistem as an example, the metaphor was not a building, a, a, a tree or something like that. It was a circle. So yeah. imagine if you get all these disciplines and instead of having a straight line, now you have a kind of Uroboros structure, a circle. Yeah. yeah. So now the question is, what is real in this new order of knowledge? Yeah. And that's my point. We okay. can access, access reality through humanities, through natural let's, sciences, through all these parts yeah, of... Let, let's stop there, Gustavo, because... I mean, we're going to stop reality. We're going to we're going to stop on the snake biting its own tail because we have to. Um, so I, I'm just going to end it there. And I'm going to thank everybody for joining us, and please join us for our next webinars. And of course, Gustavo will be with us uh, at the conference in in May. You can you can talk to him and ask your questions there. So I know I didn't get to yours, and Christine, I know I didn't get to yours, but we just ran out of time. So thank you very much. And, thank you, Jeff. Uh, all right. We'll see you soon, Gustavo. I'm Absolutely. sorry to close this one. I just have to. Yes. All right. No Bye -bye. problem. Thank you. Bye-bye.